You've got a woman who had a revelation from God that she was going to die and prepared for her death. Or did her husband murder her? He placed her hand inside the tub and began to hold her down. Clues left behind. There's always reference to Doug on those writings, either Doug's visions or Doug said this or Doug told me that. But few questions answered. Things didn't quite add up right. And what about the other woman who she named to take her place? Celine called me. She said, I want you to be together immediately. I want you to take care of my children. A mystery still unsolved. One thing you can't argue is the same one thing she said was going to happen that didn't happen. The mysterious death of Faylene Grant. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. How far would you go for something you believe in? Could it cause you to give up everything you hold dear? Faylene Grant was a devout Mormon who kept a journal detailing her religious visions. And one of those visions was of her own death. So when her lifeless body was found under suspicious circumstances, people looked to those writings for clues. But as Jay Shadler first reported in 2009, Faylene's final days would remain as mystifying as the words she left behind. Tippinogas Park near Provo, Utah is a spectacularly beautiful place. A place where someone who believes that they can speak directly to God might want to come and have a conversation. Faylene Grant believed that she could speak to God. She had visions. She heard angels. She also predicted her own death. Or was it murder? Either way, what happened here was very important. And we're going to tell you why in just a few moments. But until then, we want you to set aside all the assumptions about right and wrong, guilt or innocence, and follow a murder case from Gilbert, Arizona to the Celestial Kingdom. She said, I'm going to take a bath. And I could see that she's walking toward the bathtub as I lay down. And I wake up. And I know something's up. There was no noise, nothing. I just... And I yelled for her. I ran in the bathroom, and she was under the water. I got her out. And I took her back to the bed. And I know CPR it wasn't working. On the morning of September 27, 2001, Douglas Grant says he woke to find his wife, Faylene, drowning in their bathtub, this bathtub. He called a physician's assistant he knew, Chad White. I called Chad. You gotta come. I took the prescriptions. I found her in the tub. You gotta come. I'm scared. Several hours later, after being rushed to a nearby hospital, Faylene's heart stopped and she was pronounced dead. Local police in Gilbert, Arizona initially viewed her death as accidental, though the medical examiner officially labeled it undetermined. And undetermined it has remained until now. All right. The case of the state of Arizona versus Douglas Grant reads like a Hollywood script complete with a prosecutor with a penchant for the jugular. You knew that if she died, there would be a chance for you and the man that you loved, right? Mr. Martinez, that is... Yes or no? No. And a defense attorney with his own flair for the dramatic. What you decide will live beyond this courtroom. Behind them is a cast of family, friends, and witnesses who alternately portray the defendant as an innocent victim of circumstance or the devil in a Brooks Brothers suit. Either way, the entire trial is being played out on the biggest stage of all, heaven and hell, eternal salvation or damnation. Faylene was a devout Mormon who believed in revelations. You've got a woman who methodically saw God had a revelation from God that she was going to die and prepared for her death. She purchased life insurance that she hoped would go into effect. She planned her own funeral, selected the speaker, selected the music, and in her farewells told loved ones who had had other loved ones die before, I'm going to go see those loved ones. That preparation went as far as asking her husband to marry another woman, this woman, Hillary DeWitt. Describe for me what you think Faylene saw 
as the celestial kingdom and your relationship in it? I think she saw us all as a family. I think she did. I think she saw us as, you know, an eternal family. And so now, seven years after failing Grant's death, the final scene is about to be written by the jury. We, the jury, do find the... But how did things ever get to this point? For that, we have to go back to the beginning, the beginning of Doug Grant's relationship with Faleen, a woman that many loved and admired, Faleen's mom, Glenna Eves. She was a happy person. She, if she walked into this room right now, we would all have to turn and it, we would all just smile. It, she brightened up any room she ever came into. She taught me as much about life and kindness than anybody did in my life. You and Faleen had spectacular days. It was phenomenal. Um, she loved life, and so we had a great marriage. Had two beautiful little boys and uh, um, traveled the world. It was great. There's little mystery behind what drew Doug Grant and Faleen Eves together. Both had previously been married. Both had backgrounds in nutrition and fitness. And both were Mormons, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Faleen was extremely devout, believing wholeheartedly in the Mormon doctrine of personal revelation, that a faithful member can receive guidance directly from God. Faleen's younger sister, Jody Stratton. She was Christ-like, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing to be religious. It's a good thing to love Heavenly Father and to love Christ and to want to be like them. And that's what she was. And I think a lot of times people try to paint her as she was so fanatical spiritually that she wasn't a real person. And it's not true. There was a side of her probably greater than anybody I've known that was the spiritual side. And it manifested a lot of times in great ways to help us all. And at other times we wouldn't understand. But it is who she was. Some people call it fanaticism. It was her, that was her strength. Doug's calling was rather different. By the mid-90s, he had built a booming business with nutritional supplements and health consulting. He even did work with NBA teams like the Phoenix Suns. This little kid in the small town now working with a professional athlete. You're a hot shot. I was a hot shot. There was money and lots of it. But there was also infidelity, a grave sin for any more. Made a mistake. You, you've made a bunch of mistakes. I made a bunch of mistakes. Doug's repeated cheating deeply hurt Faleen, and they divorced in 2000. Faleen's kids from her first marriage, Jenna and Austin Stradling, remember the sting of their mom's breakup with Doug. I remember I would be in my bedroom at night crying myself to sleep because I was sad they got a divorce. It was hard. Eventually, the couple moved on, but remained in close touch for their kids. Doug, meanwhile, had begun to fall for a much younger woman. 16 years younger. Hillary DeWitt was 19 when Doug hired her to work at his company. I didn't think I was going to ever get married again. And then thinking, oh my gosh, I'm falling in love with Hillary. And Hillary, you. Oh, definitely in love with Doug. I was pretty dang close, I think, within a month or two, probably, of asking her to marry me. You know, she felt it, I felt it, we were going there. And then, Texas. In July 2001, Doug took a fateful business trip to Dallas with his ex-wife, Faleen, in order to settle a company lawsuit. During it, they shared stories about their kids and the supreme importance of family. At the end, there was talk of reconciliation. That must have come as a blow to you. I felt like, you know, Doug told me he had to work out his feelings, but I still felt like, you know, Doug and I would be together. As for Faleen, she did what she often did when faced with a big decision. She went to a Mormon temple to ask God what she should do. He's like, I'm going to go to San Diego and pray about this one last time. But you know what? I'll take an angel from God to come down and tell me to get back with you. Well, guess what? I get a phone call bright and early. And on the other end of the phone's Faleen. I was told in the San Diego temple from God to remarry you. Quite a revelation for Hillary, too. She had just spent the night with Doug. He came out of the bathroom, and I was standing there, and I said, it's over, isn't it? And he said, it's over. No, this mystery is just getting started. Coming up... She called me and said I remarried Doug. All I remember from that moment on was telling her, he better treat you better. The ink is almost not dry on that wedding license or certificate. The defendant calls Hillary's cell phone. He's a married man now. Leave her alone, but he won't. Stay with us.
Faileen Grant has been found dead in her own bathtub. Was it an accident, suicide, or something more sinister? As investigators study the last months of Faileen's life, they look for clues as to why she might have killed herself or why her husband might have wanted her dead. Once again, here's Jay Schaefer. A lot of strange stories roll down the highways between San Diego and Las Vegas, but there's no roadmap for where this story and murder trial are headed. Yeah, God said, go to Sin City, my, my child, and there, there you shall be married. Y you really think that that's what Faileen heard in the temple? Faileen Eves had gone to the sacred Mormon temple in San Diego to ask God directly if she should remarry her ex-husband, Doug Grant. According to Doug, who you'll remember was right on the verge of proposing to his girlfriend, Hillary DeWitt, God's answer was yes, which threw a hard curve into this lover's triangle. And I'm like, Faileen, you've got to understand something. I don't know if that's true, because I was just with Hillary last night. We were together intimately. I, I don't know how you could have had a vision like this. And she says, that's interesting. All I can tell you is that I had been told in the San Diego temple to remarry you, that you were accepting repentance. And I freaked out. But sensing that Faileen's revelations were not something to be trifled with, Doug immediately packs up the couple's two children and heads to San Diego. You went to the temple. I absolutely went to the temple. Why? Why'd you go? Because I wanted to know what's up. I want to know from Faileen's own words, looking in her eyes, Faileen, what happened in there? What? Be honest with me. I've got to make a final decision here. It's not fair to Hillary. It's not fair, especially to Hillary, because I was just with her. Precisely what Faileen saw, heard, or felt in the temple will never be known. But Doug says she convinced him that they would be husband and wife again sometime down the road. Which brings us back to this highway. Because en route to Phoenix that very night, the couple makes a most curious detour. She wakes me up and says, I think we're on the wrong, I didn't make the right turn. And she thought there might be other reasons, not knowing why, but she thought it was a sign. And I said... <laughs> she thought it was a sign, and the sign said... The sign said Las Vegas. That's right, just hours after her apparent communion with God, Doug and Faileen stood inside the chapel at the Excalibur Hotel in Sin City, exchanging wedding vows for the second time. Back in Arizona, news of the Las Vegas marriage was met with skepticism from Faileen's sisters, Shirlene Patterson and Jody Stratton. She called me and said I remarried Doug. And all I remember from that moment on was telling her, he better treat you better. And the next time I saw Doug, I told him the same thing. He said, I will, I promise. I'm different, I'm changed. I will, I promise. I, I bet I asked her at least four times, do you love him? She never once in that whole phone call told me she loved him. But she did tell me that I felt like I needed to get my family back together. Not surprisingly, Hillary's reaction was something closer to thunderstruck. My cousin Paige called me and told me, I have to tell you something. And I said, OK. And she said, Doug and Faileen got remarried a couple days ago. And I went, what? If you think that's surprising, consider this. The person who ultimately mends Hillary's broken heart and refreshes her faith in God and the Mormon Church is none other than Failing Grant. Bizarre. It's absurd. It's surreal. Paul Rubin, a reporter with the New Times in Phoenix, has been covering the case since the beginning. In the annals of crime, you'll never see a relationship that is more mind-boggling than the one that developed between Hillary DeWitt and Failing Grant after Faileen remarried Doug. Never. I don't think anybody understands the role that Faileen played in my life at that time. Hillary and Faileen, ex-girlfriend and ex-wife, now become... Is love too strong of a word to use about your relationship? No, no, not at all. I love Faileen deeply, and I did so much at that time. Faileen had always kept a journal and wrote letters about her feelings on faith and family. Now, in a surprising string of correspondence, Faileen seems to become a sort of Mormon mentor to the younger Hillary. Dear Hillary, I have had extremely deep feelings that Heavenly Father has and is continuing to prepare you for a major calling in this earth life. Faileen 
was like a sister, a mother, a spiritual advisor, a best friend, all wrapped up into one for me. And what did Phalene's family make of the relationship? This was my comment. I think Phalene is going for sainthood. <laughs> <laughs> because, see, I, it's hard for me to comfort him being that kind and loving and forgiving. But if you knew Faye, it wouldn't surprise you at all. But letters from Faylene weren't the only thing Hillary was receiving. In the wake of Doug and Faylene's remarriage, records show call after call after call between Doug and Hillary's cell phones. Doug and Hillary insist that the calls either included Faylene or were strictly between the two women. But the authorities believe it's a telephonic trail tracking straight to guilt. Sergeant Cy Ray with the Gilbert Police Department picked up the case three weeks after Faylene's drowning. Doug is an individual who wants to portray the, the perfect family, the perfect job. Although he follows through with Faylene, appearance-wise, clearly he had some doubts about it. The ink is almost not dry on that wedding license or certificate. The defendant calls Hillary's cell phone. He's a married man now. Leave her alone, but he won't in reviewing the writings back and forth between Faylene and Hillary, it was very clear that Hillary was not disclosing to Faylene that she was in contact with Doug. And the fact that that was missing indicates that there was a lot more of those conversations. But beyond the phone calls, something else is happening, and it's written in Faylene's own hand. Suddenly her journals are filled with revelations of death, hers, not suicide per se, but an end to her earthly life. September 7th. Tonight, I told Jody and Shan, as I'd felt I should six days ago, that I didn't think I'd be here a lot longer. September 17th. I feel like there's no way to say goodbye to everyone. I just feel time running out. And like, no, wait, I'm not ready to go yet. Faylene believed with all her heart that she was going to die. She was very committed, and I believed what she was saying. In the last month of her life, did you ever say to her, Faylene, you've got to stop talking like this? Yes. In the last month? Absolutely. She talked to everyone about it. I mean, her parents talk about it, friends talk about it. It was just who Faylene was. It was so engulfing. But others see Faylene's premonitions not as prompted by God, but by Doug Grant. When you read the journal entries around September, uh, the first part of September, it's not her feelings anymore. It's Doug's. Doug is having this. Doug is telling me that. Um, and that was the big change that I saw in her writings and her feelings. I must have faith in Doug's vision. No matter whose visions they were, one thing's clear. By late September, Faylene believes her death is imminent. Faylene called me and told me that she knew she was going to die and that it was going to be really, really soon. And she said she felt that she was supposed to have verbal confirma confirmation from me that I would take care of her family. What exactly was Faylene envisioning, and why? Why did you go to Utah? She wanted to go. Suddenly. Suddenly. We're going to Utah, too, to find out what happened in the Timpanogos Canyons. Did you push her? We'll be right back. Faylene Grant has gotten back together with her ex-husband, Doug. Friends and family are surprised by her sudden decision, but they're about to be shocked by what happens next. Here again, Jay Shadler. Jenna Stradling has bittersweet memories of her mother Faylene's sudden remarriage to Doug Grant in 2001. She was extremely happy. This is what she'd been wanting her whole life, is a husband who loved her and that's what Doug promised, so she was thrilled, of course. But just a month after the wedding, Faylene's notes and letters seem to suggest she is preparing for her own death. And in one of those letters, she makes an astonishing request to Hillary DeWitt, her husband's ex-girlfriend. I want you to be the mother of my children. I want you to teach them how precious each of our Heavenly Father's children is. And remind them that they are not only precious to Heavenly Father, but to their mother who has been physically called to serve her mission elsewhere. Hillary says just a few days later, this time in a phone call, she receives another more urgent plea from Faylene. 
What does she say? I can hear her voice to this day. She said, you know, she wanted Doug and I to be together immediately. She told me nothing will be too soon. I want you to be together immediately. I want you to take care of my children. Strangely, these unsettling requests come just as Doug and Faleen set out on a sort of second honeymoon, visiting some of the most sacred Mormon historical sites in the country, a longtime dream of Faleen's. But just a few days after reaching Nauvoo, Illinois, which had been a home to the Mormon prophet Joseph Smith, Doug says Faleen suddenly changes plans. She wants to go to the Tippinogos Cave National Monument in Utah. There's nothing wrong with that in my mind, no red flags. I had taken the boys a year before when we were divorced. She had seen the pictures and heard the boys tell her about the little hike up to this cave at Tippinogos, and she wanted to go there. By the next morning, the couple was a thousand feet up looking out over these majestic canyons. At Lover's Point, Doug took these snapshots, including this one of Faleen near the edge of a sheer cliff. You know, she's talking about this is where the pioneers came through. You know, I can envision them coming through here. And the talk did get a little more out there. There was some concern. And so there is me getting up, because we were sitting on the path, just talking, and she got up and went out there, no big deal. But then when she started going further out, there was concern. And she goes, no, I can just really envision this. And she looked up in the sky, and she said, I can picture Heavenly Father and Jesus shapes in the clouds. What'd you say? What'd you do? I got up and said, Faleen. And as I started going to where that rock wall was, a good 10, 12 feet away, where I could see her, she slipped. There's not a scintilla in my body that thought she was alive. If you look off that cliff, you don't see a tree. You just see rocks. So I run down there, and I'm yelling for help. I'm yelling for her, knowing that she's going to probably be dead. And I hear her say, shut up. <laughs> And she's standing, and she says, shut up, I'm okay. According to testimony at trial, Faleen fell at least 60 feet. That's a long way, almost up to the top of that ridge. For a lot of folks, the idea that she could fall that far and not even suffer a broken bone is, well, to put it politely, far-fetched. Can someone take a fall 60 feet like this and not come away with even a broken bone? I would say it's highly unlikely. Chief Ranger Mike Gossie oversees the park and has worked on this mountain for almost 17 years. He says the canyons are unforgiving. The rocks are very jagged here. They're, they're very sharp. Uh, you fall from several feet and it seems like you're going to get a laceration or a cut. Records show Doug did take Faleen to a local hospital where she was given pain pills and treated for cuts and bruises. But the doctors and nurses who treated her remained skeptical of the fall. Usually a fall of that height is, you see many more injuries than, than, I would, than you did in this case. Would you expect to see broken bones, perhaps? Yes. What else would you expect to see? You would not expect them to live most of the time. Still, if she did fall, did you push her? No. I wasn't even close to her. Did you know she was so close to the edge? <sighs> if you... The answer is... Yes and no. Faleen apparently confirmed Doug's version of the story when they visited with a friend of the family, Becky Greer, only hours after the fall. Described to the jury their interaction with each other on the 25th. Very loving. He would just take such doting care of her. I was jealous in my heart thinking, I, wish, I wonder if my husband would take care of me so well. Even the authorities find Doug and Faleen's time in Utah difficult, if not impossible, to explain. The only thing I can say about Timpanogos is none of it makes sense. It was clear that when she left Nauvoo to go to Utah, she knew something was going to happen. So whether at that point Faleen was completely accepting of whatever this event was and just allowed it to happen, whether she participated with it, whether she initiated it, we, we'll never know. As troubling as Timpanogos is, what follows it is deadly. In just two days, Faleen will drown in her own bathtub. Even you, too, must admit the coincidence of a near-death experience within 48 hours of her actual death is striking. How do you explain that? I don't know how you can explain it. I mean, how can you explain it? I, I don't know. I don't know.
Coming up, Doug Grant reveals what he says happened the day Faleen died. Sweetheart, I'm tired. I'm gonna go to sleep. If you still can't sleep, if you're hurting, take one of the pills. But prosecutors tell a different story. They placed her head inside the tub and began to hold her down. Stay with us. Seven years after Faleen Grant's death, her husband, Doug, is on trial for her murder. We're about to learn more about the day Faleen died and a lingering question. Could her family have seen it coming? Here again is Jay Shader. Faleen and I were, we were extremely close. And uh, she'd always tell me that, you know, you're the best brother in the world. For Duggar Eves, Faleen's brother, and the rest of her family, the last seven years have been heart-wrenching. And reliving her death during the four long months of trial have been agonizing. There's not a day goes by that I don't think of Faleen and miss her. She loved everyone that she came in contact with. And so, you know, we could always hope to be as good as Faleen was. My mom would always be there for everything. She's with me everywhere I go if I just remember her and do the right things. And that's, that's a blessing in itself. So, For Doug's family, the mysterious events of 2001 are no less painful, particularly for his sister, Tammy Fuentes. She went to Doug and Faleen's home to tidy it up before their return from Timpanogos. In their bedroom, a cold and unsettling discovery. Laid out on the bed or Faleen's temple clothes, very sacred temple clothes that are so sacred that you don't lay them out like that publicly, even in your own home. Unless she was preparing for her own death. And there was more than just the dress on the bed. There were other things that had notes on them, give to Fatima, this chair is for my brother Duggar, you know, just on and on, sticky notes on the mirror, just... I was extremely shocked and taken back at that point, and so much that I called Danny and explained to him what I had, had seen, and I was very upset and telling him what I thought. I truly had suspicion that she had tried to take her own life on that cliff. Now that you know how Thaline was was feeling and thinking as she was heading to Utah, what was she going to do there? We'll never know. We'll never know. What we do know, says Doug, is that Thaline's near-death experience in Utah ended her preoccupation with dying. It was over. She believed it was over. The idea that she was going to die was, it was over. Gone. It was gone. All I could think of was, we haven't slept in three days. We get home. Let's rest. Let's get this behind us. Let's move on with life. But Faleen is still aching from the fall. So Doug calls an acquaintance and physician's assistant, Chad White, to examine her. White gives Faleen a shot of Toradol a pain medication and prescribes additional pain pills and Ambien to sleep. Were the sleeping pills Mr. White's idea or were they Doug Grant's? Either way, Faleen ended the evening in bed with a personal pharmacy on her nightstand, Doug at her side and darkness falling. I told her, sweetheart, I'm tired. I'm gonna go to sleep. If you still can't sleep, if you're hurting, take one of the pills. Doug says Faleen woke up in the early morning hours and went into the bathroom. She comes out and she says, I'm gonna take a bath. So I said, okay. And I could see that she's walking toward the bathtub as I lay down. There was no noise, nothing. She's had visions of her death. And here you are, she's got painkillers, she's got muscle relaxants, and you fall asleep when she goes into the bathtub? I mean, what were you thinking? I did fall asleep. Is it my great regret in life? Absolutely. But I didn't harm my wife. 
Though Doug insists he called 911, there's no record of it. Instead, that emergency call was made by the physician's assistant. Things didn't quite add up right. Sergeant Cy Ray. He didn't call 911. As an investigator, to me, it, it indicates that maybe he's hiding something or was trying to conceal his actions. Toxicology tests run on Phalene's blood showed extremely high levels of the sleepy medication Ambien. And so with this rag doll that is now Phalene Grant, he dragged her over and then he placed her hand inside the tub and began to hold her down. This death scene, according to Jenna Stradley, who was just 11 years old at the time, was unfolding behind her parents' locked door. I had my hand on the door as my mom was getting drowned. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know what was going on in there. When he's doing this, he's holding her down. Can't quite get the job done. Can't quite get the job done because Jenna's at the door at about 7.30, 7.35, jiggling the doorknob. That was the worst day of my life. There is no way I will ever, ever forget what happened that day. Jenna says the door was locked. That would have been crucial, right? Yeah, if it, was, if it was accurate, yeah. Uh, the problem is, is that claim came seven years later at the beginning of the trial. She was interviewed twice by the police. That was never a claim by the police. I just felt guilty because I felt like if I would have knocked on the door, then maybe my mom would still be alive. So I felt like I helped contribute to her death somehow. For me, it was really good to just have that second of him seeing me like one one millionth of the pain that I've gone through these past years and will continue to go through for the rest of my life. Phalene Grant is dead, but the most startling clues to this mystery are still alive and only moments away. Within 24 hours of the time that Phalene dies, you're meeting with Hillary. Why did you do that? Coming up, a meeting in the park. He grabbed you by the hips and said, ooh, I missed these. Did you tell that to Carrie Handley? And a letter from the grave. We'll be right back. In courtroom 1301, the murder case against Douglas Grant is coming to an end. It's because the investigation. The long trial has taken a toll on everyone. By the time the prosecution rests its case, Doug Grant has been painted as a homicidal Svengali who convinced his wife, Faline, she was going to die so he could be with the true love of his life, Hillary DeWitt. If you actually believe in the, into the actual gut of the prosecution's theory, Doug was a cult leader of one person, Baleen. Ladies and gentlemen. The defense draws a starkly different portrait. Doug Grant as the victim of strange but innocent circumstance and a fatally flawed police investigation. Based upon what I review, it was an extremely poor uh, quality investigation. According to defense witness Tom Street, an expert in criminal investigations, crucial evidence that could have pointed to guilt or innocence, including pill bottles and clothing, was either lost or destroyed. We've lost virtually every piece of evidence that exists uh, or existed at the house because of incompetent investigators that just simply didn't do their job. As for Phalene's letters, full of passages about her impending death, not one was turned over to the county medical examiner, which led to this remarkable conclusion. The notes in the hand of the dead person are critical. I have no evidence to support this being a homicide. The state never debated the authenticity of the letters, but in their view, Phalene's pen was controlled by a master puppeteer who pulled every emotion to the breaking point. It's very easy on this case to say, oh, this, this, this woman's crazy. What is she thinking? You know, she, she had to have killed herself. But there's always reference to Doug on those writings, either Doug's visions or Doug said this or Doug told me that or in church Doug had this vision or he dreams it. Sometimes in a murder case, there comes a point where all the strands of truth and doubt are knitted together. You're left with an image that, depending on your point of view, points toward guilt or innocence. This is that moment, and this is that place. 
Feline has just died. In fact, her funeral is still being planned. And yet into this park come Doug Grant and Hillary DeWitt for a private and most extraordinary meeting. And within 24 hours of the time that Feline dies, you're meeting with Hillary. Absolutely. Why did you do that? <laughs> Honor, respect. The rest of the world will hear this and I agree. I don't care. I found a letter the night that Feline died, 27th night. Dear Doug and Hillary, I want to add to the request I made this morning and share another desire I have for you to be married immediately and to see you sitting as husband and wife at my funeral has been so strong. That's probably the same face I made when I read it. Please state your name. But testimony from Hillary's friend suggests, in addition to the letter, Doug was carrying his old desires into the park that night. Was there ever any indication from her that there was ever any physical contact? She said, as he was like leaning in the door of his Tahoe, that he reached over and grabbed her hips and pulled them against him and said, mm, I miss these. He grabbed you by the hips and said, ooh, I miss these. Did you tell that to Carrie Handley? No, I did not. It's not yeah. something you do the day your wife dies. You don't go meet your girlfriend. Or even the next day or week. You know, whenever she wants to say it happened, you don't do that. Feline's letter from the grave might never have come to light had Doug and Hillary not taken her last words as gospel. To nearly everyone's surprise, the couple was married just three weeks after Feline's death. Where are we at, guys? Where are we at? In keeping with Feline's wishes, Hillary adopted Doug and Feline's two boys, Marley and Braven. I mean, Braven pulls it out. Who hit the red first? I think Braven did by about six inches. And now have a daughter together, Nevea. Heaven spelled backwards. Hi, Nevea. <laughs> we can have our feelings of Feline. The world can have their feelings of Feline. But the one thing you can't argue is name one thing she said it was going to happen that didn't happen. I can promise you that you will have special trials. <laughs> if you accept this calling, I can also promise you that if it is Heavenly Father's will, you will receive special blessings and that I will do all I'm allowed to do to support you from the other side. Do you, do you feel her support? Oh, I know her support's here. Absolutely. That's what gets me through it. That's, you know, knowing how Feline felt and knowing that she wanted me to be with Doug, that she wanted me to be with her kids, it makes it easier. Still, in seven years of marriage, there have only been a few days when they weren't walking under a cloud of suspicion. Do you ever regret getting Hillary in, involved in your life? Absolutely. No. I do. No. No. You shouldn't regret it for a moment. There's many times. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Now, in the hours before dawn, in the last week of the trial, Doug leaves their home in Pima, Arizona. Love you wearing an electronic ankle bracelet so the cops know where he is, and travels three hours toward that Phoenix courtroom where a jury will decide his fate. That indelible moment that defines a life and sometimes a family. Have you had the conversation with the kids? We've had to be honest with them because they have to know what the possibilities are. To say their hearts are not broke, yeah. they're not fearful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You have a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, an 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. The five-year-old doesn't understand that daddy might go away. They hate the thought of things that could, that could happen, but they get it. But Nevea doesn't get it. Go! Pick him up, Nevea! Nevea, I got the punch on for you! Nevea, go to Hunter! She may not be alone. Even the jury appears to have had a hard time with this case. 14 days of deliberations hint at the difficulty of their task. On the table, not two, but three options for guilt. First degree murder, second degree, and manslaughter. At a minimum, a guilty verdict would likely put Grant in jail for nearly a decade. 
We, the jury, duly and paneled and sworn upon our oaths, do find the defendant, Douglas D. Grant, as to count one, first-degree murder, unable to agree. We, the jury, do find the defendant on the lesser-included offense of second-degree murder, unable to agree. We, the jury, do find the defendant on the lesser-included offense of manslaughter, guilty. Sadly, a verdict won't end this story. Faylene's oldest children. If I could say something to Doug, I would tell him that my mom's not going to be at my wedding. My mom hasn't been able to meet my first boyfriend. She's never going to be able to see her grandchildren. Even though I do know in my heart that he did do it, for some reason my mom left something behind with me to, to forgive him and to not go crazy and to take the higher road. I still have dreams about her and I still feel her with me and I see evidence of her her workings in, in my life and um, that's something that she left with us too is that we can we can still pray and still do the things that we know our mom would want us to do. I feel like I'm working with the strength of two moms, not just one. Because <laughs> I know Kaylee's on our side. She would not want us to be sitting here like this, talking about it. That wasn't failing. She never wanted to be the center of attention. She's probably <laughs> up there shaking her finger. <laughs> Doug Grant was sentenced to five years in prison. He was released in 2014. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition 2020 on ID.